Hello and welcome back to Chilled Art. Uh, today we're going to do some character design and at least have some time to talk about character design because firstly it's a major part of my job and secondly it's one of my favourite things to do. It's uh, something I've been doing for pretty much as long as I can remember is uh, inventing my own characters and drawing them. It's just something that I naturally find fun and interesting and so I've spent a lot of time over the years kind of getting good at it uh, or at least uh, good enough that I can do it professionally and uh, people uh, people say I'm a good character designer and I'd, I'd like to believe that. Uh, so character design is one of those things that tends to get really underrated I think in terms of difficulty um, there are an awful lot of uh, like games and comics and the like that have really not great character designs in them <laughs> like objectively uh, so I just feel like I should go through like uh, at least some stuff that could help you make better character designs yourself. Um, so I've, I've tried to construct a checklist here and then I'm going to show you some stuff that I've done myself. Um, so when you're considering a character design, for me one of the most important things is the cultural and historical setting. Um, oh by the way, I'm in uh, Manga Studio at the moment which is one of my favourite programs for drawing and doing line art and inking. It's now called Clip Studio. It's a pretty affordable program, uh, really good for line art and doing comics. It has like all sorts of comic making tools. But anyway, uh, cultural and historical setting is pretty much obviously um, where is your story set? Where does your character come from? Um, where do they stand within that society? So what is expected of them? What are they trying to tell people who meet them about who they are through what they wear? Because when we get dressed in the morning we make conscious decisions and when we buy our clothes we make decisions about what are these clothes saying about me? Uh, what am I saying about myself through this clothing? Um, so you have to think about the culture in which that character is raised, like uh, is to, are there rules about how much exposure of the body is acceptable in that culture? Or is the weather hot or cold? Does this need to be kept in mind? Because that really annoys me when a character designer isn't creative enough to come up with an interesting character design that is plausible within the climate um, or the politics of the setting. It's just like, really? You couldn't think of any way to make a good looking character within these simple rules? Like, come on. Um, historical setting. Now, not all characters you make are going to live in our world necessarily at any point in history, but I don't think there's ever been a fantasy setting that hasn't had some kind of influence of where it's set historically in terms of like technology level and culture. So for example, um, when you look at Final Fantasy XIII, it's a sci-fi game, it's, it's science fiction fantasy, it's set in a kind of futuristic setting, but the clothing that the characters wear has clear cultural and historical roots. You can see that the, the characters from Cocoon are dressed in this kind of modern way. There are some sci-fi flourishes, but you can trace it to, like, say, modern Japanese street fashion. Uh, whereas the characters from Cocoon, you can see all of these influences from kind of uh, various tribal dress, 
and also with Fang. I mean, she's wearing a clearly kind of Indian inspired outfit. You can look at that and go, oh yeah, I can see where the influences for this outfit are coming from. So histor historical could be called a uh, technological setting. And you need to think about that because you can add modern elements to a, uh, a fantasy setting, but you have to be sensible with them. Like you have to think about what the technology level of that place is. For example, in order to make Velcro and in order to make zips, you need machinery. You cannot make those two things without machinery. So putting zips into a fantasy setting that doesn't have machinery doesn't make any sense unless they have like magic powered machinery to create those things. Whereas there are other things that could have been invented in an earlier time period than they were, for example, cable knit jumpers. Uh, the, the concept of cable knitting was not come up with in medieval times, nobody thought of it, but they had all the necessary things to do cable knitting in medieval times, so they could have cable knit, they just, nobody thought of it before. So you can do things like that, you can make modern looking garments, you just might need to change how they fasten. Um, so, for example, if you decide that you want your fantasy character to wear something that looks like a hoodie, that works so long as you can think of a way that it fastens other than a zip. Uh, for example, a, a pullover hoodie, one of the ones that doesn't have a zip, one of the ones you just pull over your head, could have been invented in medieval times. It's just nobody thought to make a garment like that. So you could feasibly have like a fantasy medieval hoodie and have these clothes that are medieval in tech level and have these medieval flourishes but clearly reference fashions of our time uh, which brings me to symbolism uh, so symbolism can be simple things like um, I don't know like you can I mean Language and literature and art are just packed with symbolism and metaphor, so I think a really good example is Final Fantasy VIII, where you have Squall and Renoa. Uh, Squall's symbol is the lion, and so you see a lot of uh, lion flourishes in his character design. He has a lion engraved on his weapon, he wears a pendant that has a lion's head on it, he has a lion on his belt buckle, and he wears a jacket that has a furry collar that brings to mind the mane of a lion. And that's sort of like, oh okay, so this guy is, like his whole thing is sort of being brave and sort of working, like being strong, and that's kind of the ideal he strives towards as a character. Whereas Renoa, uh, her symbol is of course angel wings. She even has them on her back. She has like this uh, angel wing design on the back of like her, her cardigan thing. Uh, I always thought that was like the coolest cardigan ever when I was a teenager. Uh, Renoa's long cardigan, which has these wings on the back. Um, and she's frequently shown with like feathers and wing motifs, which shows that she's sort of this uh, this kind of uh, angelic, uh, like she's she's very kind and empathetic and things. So it it gets across that um, motif. Sometimes it's more subtle than just like putting a motif on the character's outfit, sometimes, uh, like with Squall's furry collar, sometimes just the shape and colours you use will bring to mind something about that kind of, um, something about the, the shape of something will bring to mind something else. For example, you might have a character wear something where the shape of it resembles something. For example, um, Rocket in my webcomic Fandango, uh, her clothing often has petal-like shapes to it. So like she, when you first meet her, she's wearing 
like this jacket and it has like these long petal like tails on the back uh, which get across a flower like look um, and she's frequently shown with uh, these these delicate petal like shapes that get across that she is kind of linked to nature and that kind of delicacy and the fact that she like has the soul of a fairy it's it's all kind of bringing the the audience towards that and you also have cultural symbolism which is where even if a character is in a fantasy setting you could use elements of 1980s punk to bring the audience to the easy conclusion as soon as they look at them they go oh okay that character is punk and they they know what to expect from them you you might are oh, like gothic like that's common like using gothic elements to a character's design even though the concept of a goth with like um like as we know, as we think of a goth today, it's a modern concept, but if you think about Morrigan from Dragon Age, she's clearly supposed to bring to mind like a teenage goth. She's got this uh, red and like this dark red and black outfit that has like a hood and she's got like lots of black feathers and she's got this like dress, this kind of leather belt dress thing that all hangs down and she's got like the dark eyeshadow and the, the dark eyeliner and the the kind of um, feathery black hair and you look at her and you go oh okay she's a goth and you can immediately feel like you know something about that character through these elements of modern subculture. I'll show you an example of uh, designs where that's come out as well. You can do it the opposite way around as well though. You can, for example, design a modern character who brings to mind like the shapes of say a medieval knight so that you immediately look at that character and go, oh I get what that character's about. They, they're supposed to make me think of a knight and everything that goes with that. Uh, you'll see it often used in uh, good character design in games and anime and the like, sometimes more subtly than others. Um, uh, silhouette and shape is a really important part of doing character design. Uh, so firstly for differentiating the characters because you don't want everybody to have the same the same shape to them. So here's a bunch of stick figures. Um, all right, okay, stick figures. Um, this is a real problem when a game only has one male and one female character model. You get like, um, you get a party of people who when they're standing next to each other they look practically identical and it's just like, like, oh, one of them has a sword and one of them has a staff and this guy has guns. But it's like, apart from that, I have no idea who these people are. <laughs> um, so you might decide like, oh, the, the sword person, they're going to have like this cool cloak and that's, and like maybe they've got like a winged headdress thing going on. Um, like which makes it sort of like, oh, that it's that character, okay, the one who wears the big cloak and um, and like maybe the this character is sort of, they're like the leader character, so like the everyman, so got kind of an in-between physique or something, um, and then you might decide that the staff person is like some kind of um, tough defender type and you might decide let's make this guy quite like chunky um so he's like this chunky guy um he's got like stuff um so he's got like a square shape going on uh, I'll talk through like shapes in a minute um okay so the 
the other one's like, oh, this guy's got uh, guns, so maybe I'm gonna go with like a kind of tall, thin kind of silhouette with like a long coat that comes right, almost right down to the floor. Um, so he looks kind of lofty and almost like priest, like that kind of very kind of Neo from the Matrix look going on, like, uh, that makes him look kind of tall and elegant, even if these characters are all being drawn as if they're the same height, uh, which the problem with like character heights in games is that it causes all sorts of problems with the framing of the <laughs> cameras and shots, <laughs> especially in games where you can choose what height your character is. Um, that's always a fun one in Neverwinter Nights too, where it's like uh, you you play a halfling, but you don't get a sense of how small your character is in dialogue because if to avoid this problem, they always make the camera just zoom right in on your face. <laughs> Um, okay, and then we've got this other character who, maybe my idea for this one is that their thing is being, cause they're, they're around, so like maybe they're kind of wiry, so they're like really skinny, like, and maybe they've got like, I don't know, a scarf that like trails, or like flowing hair that gives them this kind of top heavy, uh, top heavy design, and then like very skinny legs or something. Um, so that's a very, very basic idea. So the, the basic shapes of character design, um, as a general rule, we have, uh, you have a uh, circle, triangle, square. It's very, very basic. So circles give a sense of softness, uh, but also bounciness, like you can get a lot of energy in a circle. So characters uh, who are based around a circle, uh, they can, it, it also is friendly. So sort of you, you have, say a character like Mario is um, built around this uh, circular shape. Um, in fact, a lot of, and like a round head as well, can look friendly, um, gives a gives a nice kind of friendly look, um, and you might have the, like giving characters round hair shapes uh, also can look soft and fluffy and friendly and bouncy and uh, generally kind of warm and inviting and comfortable. Uh, triangles look dynamic, uh, so obviously um, when you see a, a triangular physique, you tend to think of somebody who is uh, kind of strong uh, because we see like broad shoulders and a narrow waist and it's like, oh okay, that person is sort of, uh, you tend to think, oh that person's like fit and healthy and like cultural ideal of masculine attractiveness is this triangle shape. But a uh, triangle can also look uh, dynamic so if you do like triangular hair, you get this uh, look that's aerodynamic and fast. Uh, so Sonic the Hedgehog is an interesting character because his shape, at least classically, was a combination of triangles and circles with these, and then he had like these skinny little legs. Over the years, they've made Sonic's legs longer and longer and his body less and less round. Um, which is interesting. It it makes him look more dynamic, but less kind of cute. Uh, round shapes tend to be cute, like when you draw like a chibi character. Let's just try and get that circle actually round. Um, squares look uh, solid. Uh, so when you build characters around square shapes, you tend to get a look of uh, being grounded, being reliable, uh, but it's they're not dynamic looking. So like when you see sort of big bruiser characters, they tend to be built around kind of these big square shapes. Like, uh, yeah, if you don't taper the legs much, especially using like either like stylistic or giving them like big 
trousers at the bottom uh, and a big square head. So you you this is like this is the guy in a fighting game who'd be like the big bruiser character who doesn't move fast but like hits like a train. Um, square hairstyles in the same way tend to give a sort of uh, solid uh, look, kind of um, kind of reliable, strong, unmoving. That kind of feeling you get from square-shaped characters. Um, so those are like your basic shapes. Uh, the interesting thing is that there's also another element I think in silhouette and shape which is uh, one of gravity. Gravity. Uh, so I always think about the gravity of a character in terms of up or down. So when I think of a downward uh, character, uh, I think uh, serious, grounded, uh, maybe they're not that dynamic, maybe they're kind of thoughtful, slow moving, um, reliable, sort of downcast in their emotions, like they, they don't, they they kind of might be a bit of a pessimist, um, and so to me that's a character with downward gravity. When I think about a character with downward gravity particularly, I tend to think of uh, Sabre from Fate Stay Night. You know, she's got a sword and a head, but then she's got this big skirt and these big clunky boots, and she's got these like uh, armoured things down her legs, um, which gives... I mean, Sabre can actually move very fast when she wants to, but when you look at Sabre, she looks uh, tough and reliable. Uh, she looks like she could pretty much survive anything you throw at her, because she's completely grounded. Her, her gravity is going down, um, which gives you the sense that you can rely on her. She's tough, uh, she doesn't take any crap, She's not prone to like flights of fancy or being romanticist. Uh, so that's a downward gravity character. Upward gravity characters are energetic, flighty, um, they might be fun and silly and uh, fast moving, they're optimistic, uh, or they might be cowardly. There's somebody who isn't grounded and might not be that reliable, but they've got a lot of energy and movement about them. Um, so let's try to think. When I think upward gravity, um, I might think of, say, Selfie from Final Fantasy VIII, who's got like, she's got this tiny little mini dress and she's always jumping around because um, she's that kind of. Uh, she's always like lifting up her feet as well when you watch her, like, her character animations. Uh, Selfie from FF8 is like one of my favourite characters, so she's always lifting her arms in the air and lifting her arms up. Um, and then of course she's got this hair that literally flicks up at the ends. It's like, this is an upward gravity character. She's got little nunchucks. Yeah, Selfie. Um, she's got upward gravity going on. Um, and you also see characters who, in fact, Zell from Final Fantasy VIII, he has this hair that sticks up, like it, it all sticks up at the front like this, and he is clearly an upwards gravity character, uh, whereas in the same game you have Quistis, whose hair is, whose hair, like, it goes down at, at the front, like, Quistis glasses, so she has this hair that is long at the front um, that makes her grounded and then like her outfit is like this long skirt one over trousers that again it, it, it has a weight to it that grounds the character. Um, so character gravity to me is an important part of the shape. If you have lots of upward pointing shapes, if the hair is going up, um, if they've got like their collar is turned up and uh, sort of they have like shoulder pads pointing up and uh, they don't wear like too much long stuff that's too heavy, they don't wear a lot of things that give them a lot of weight around their lower leg, you tend to get an 
upward character, character who has upward gravity, who looks energetic. Uh, whereas if you have like long coats, long skirts, lots of downward pointing elements, long heavy sleeves, anything that has a bell-shaped sleeve that sort of gets wider towards the ends, and also like bell-bottomed trousers and heavy boots tend to give this look. Uh, you like long hair that isn't curly, it just like falls right straight um, or just flops down uh, or is just cropped close, you'll get a downward energy to that character. So that's gravity. Uh, then we have uh, balance. Uh, there are two different things I think of as balance. One of them is detail balance, which is where you put uh, the different levels of detail on a character. Uh, so you, you'll you often see a character who has too much uh, detail just everywhere, like here's a basic outline of character. Um, I think a character who everybody thinks of when you think this character has too much going on would maybe be Tidus from Final Fantasy X because it's like there is nowhere on his character design that just lets you rest. It's just like everything is going on. He's got like one long leg, one short pant leg, he's got like this this weird lederhosen thing going on and then he's got a jacket over it and then he's got like a shoulder pad thing and he's got like and he's got like these boots on and one of his legs has a thing on it and it, it's just and then I mean, he's got a hood and he's got like a pendant and he's got it's just like what is going on here just just stop stop what are you doing um, so one of the things I think is that uh, you should pick one or two areas of detail that are going to have something detailed on them on the character keep everything else pretty plain um, I mean, you don't want just voids of blank space. Uh, well, it depends on what you're designing for, because on a comic character, I may well uh, give them like completely plain trousers, like just pure black. I'll, I'll, pr I'll show you a character where I've done that that probably wouldn't work for a game. Um, so I might just go completely dark there, and then I'll give them like I don't know, like they might have like this cool military coat, so then they've got like this nice detailed area of buttons, and they might have like epaulets going on up here, and like I don't know, like cool gloves and things up here. Um, you can still afford more detail up here, so maybe they've got like I don't know, like military medals up here, but like. The jacket is the detailed part, um, then your eyes can rest on the legs. Maybe a bit too much, so you might decide like, oh we'll put some buckles down the legs here. And that's a nice level of detail. If you go to, if like, if we started putting like things on the legs and I don't know, let's have some belts around here and some pockets, you're just starting to get a bit overcomplicated. Firstly, like if you're doing this in a comic, this design is too complicated. Um, they would take too long to draw each time. Uh, it's always something you need to take into account. With a game's character, you only need to make their model like once, maybe twice maximum. With a character in a comic, you will have to draw that character over and over and over again. Um, and you, it'll get really tiring if you overcomplicate them. So that's balance of detail, it's like having places where you have detail and places where the eye can just rest because there's not much detail there. The other thing is uh, balance of value, and by value I mean light and dark. Quite often when I first design a character I just design them on paper and in black and white. Uh, firstly because drawing on paper is quite a relaxing experience and you can do it out in the garden and get some fresh air and things, uh, but and like you can do it in places where you're not distracted by your computer or just in 
wherever the inspiration takes you because I, I generally always have at least one thing I can draw on <laughs> wherever I go. Um, it's always a good way to get stared at because everybody will assume you are drawing them regardless of whether you haven't looked up the entire time they will assume you are drawing them <laughs> uh it's just like yeah because uh, the idea that artists draw without any kind of reference or draw things other than what they're looking at is apparently beyond a lot of people uh so like drawn this outline of a character uh so you might decide like okay this character no, oh, there goes my phone. This character wears a dark jacket. Okay. So, dark jacket. Okay. So this is gonna be dark. Um, you would have a bit of a problem uh, if everything else on the character was dark. I mean, you can do it. I mean, you look at Noctis from FF. 15, which hasn't come out yet when I've made this video but at the same time the problem with Noctis's design is that if somebody said to you draw Noctis it's like um uh well he's got like dark hair and he wears like a dark shirt thing and and he and I guess he's got bare arms and he wears like dark pants and then he wears like dark shoes <laughs> it's like wow that, that's um i mean it, it's it's a character it looks nice as an outfit it's just not a memorable character design he's just some guy wearing a lot of dark clothes uh so generally i try to balance light and dark elements so I'll draw the character in like black and white. So I might decide, okay, then I'm going to give them a light shirt under this dark jacket. And uh, maybe they're wearing like, I don't know, maybe, yeah, sure, they can have some light pants on, but let's give them some dark boots and let's make sure that the line of the dark boots is lower than the line of the jacket. So we get this nice little poke of the light pants outside of that. Um, I might decide to give them some dark fingerless gloves uh, that go against like a light skin tone so that that's another thing. So you get this and let's put like a dark belt on them. So you get this pattern of kind of uh, let's put like a maybe they've got like a scarf that's got like light and dark stripes on it and then They've got like light skin apparently, I guess this character, so let's give them dark hair. So we get like this pattern of light dark, light dark, light dark, that breaks up the shapes of the character. And they might like have like a dark design on their shirt, like I don't know, like it's got a dark... There, so you get like, so before I've even chosen what the actual colours used for this character are, I, I know what is dark and what is light relative to each other like this might not be black it might be dark brown and something else that's dark might be navy blue or purple or sometimes red can be a dark color if it's against say yellow like if i was drawing a gryffindor scarf i would do it like this in black and white or blue and white i guess in this case and you and you would sort of be like, oh yeah, okay, they're wearing a Gryffindor scarf because the red or the like dark red of that and the yellow, ha the yellow has a lighter value to it. So that's what I mean in balance of value. It's good to have areas of dark colours and dark values contrasting light areas. Final thing we get to is colour palette, which should be the last thing that you think about because you want to get all of these other things down first. Uh, you might from the start have a colour palette in mind, uh, or you might not. I'm just going to take a sip of water because my, my, my voice is drying out. Mm. So um, colour palette is um, 
quite difficult, I think you really, I think, should pick just, like, say, two main colours. Like, keep it simple at first. Uh, so, let's, let's say that, like, um, neutrals are free. Okay, so neutrals are free. Neutrals I would define as um, white, black, brown, grey, beige, cream. Okay, so these, and another one that we tend to think of as a neutral is denim. Uh, denim is, well, you rarely ever see somebody wearing really bright blue denim. It's usually a very greyish blue, it's, it's quite desaturated, and so I don't tend to think of, uh, I mean, if you think about, a pair of blue jeans goes with practically anything. Uh, so denim doesn't tend to upset things too much in a character design. Um, w which doesn't mean we should go back to the early 90s and just have everybody wearing denim everything, but uh, you can tend to think of blue jeans as a free space, because um, they don't tend to... they don't they don't tend to set up too much of a clash, especially if you keep the the blue you use for the denim nice and desaturated. Uh, so neutrals, you can use pretty much as many of these as you want, but I recommend picking, say, two. Like, pick white and grey, or pick uh, black and brown, because if you try to use too many of these, you'll get a mess, and you'll have too many of them, there'll be too much going on. Uh, so then you want to pick two out of bright colours, um, or one or two. So say, like, the bright colours are all your things like red, yellow, oh, I, I should put them in rainbow order, red, orange, red, orange, yellow. Uh, now personally, as I've mentioned before, the, the rainbow is kind of messed up and, like, simplifies things a bit. So I'm going to say lime, emerald, teal, because the human eye can distinguish more shades of green than any other colour, so don't think of all green shades as going with all of the green shades, because they don't. You should be very, very careful with green. It's a really hard colour to use in character design, especially because in you will find this if you do anything in a lot of stories unless the setting is very very urban or is like another planet or lava land green tends to happen a lot in backgrounds especially in fantasy settings where there might be a lot of wilderness there's woodlands there's grasslands the swamps. There will be green everywhere in the, these environments and it will be very hard to make your character stand out. So beware of colouring a character green because they'll have trouble standing out from the, the background. Um, green, emerald, teal, cyan, uh, royal blue, no I'm gonna call it cobalt. That's an easier way to... cobalt. Indigo, uh, violet, magenta, and let's throw in pink as well. Okay, so pick, uh, this is the easiest way to do it, pick two of these and two of these, and that is a really surefire way to get a decent colour palette that you can just fire and forget, just like do that, and one metal. 
just one of these. All of the metal on your character, I highly recommend make all of your metallics the same colour. So I would define the metallics as, say, uh, silver. Jeez, what, who is sending me all these text messages? Why did I put... Why did I put my phone next to my computer? Sorry, guys. Silver, uh, steel, which is a bit less shiny and a bit kind of duller, but it's silver and steel are kind of the same thing. Gold, um, brass. Brass is like a less shiny, mute, more muted gold look. Copper. Um, and then you, you can have like other metallic colours but I would put them under this so like if you've got like a metallic blue it should be considered that blue is part of your colour scheme you can have small amounts of other colours on a character as I'll show you oh, why today why is today so noisy um, so you can have other colours of metals but count them towards the colour part not the metal part um, don't have too many different colours of metal on a character because it tends to look a bit off unless like metal is their theme like you might decide that you're gonna make metals their theme in which case one of your metals should count towards one of these or at least one of these if it's silver if it's silver you can count it as a neutral because it can be like grey so if you're gonna have like silver and gold as a character's colour scheme consider removing one of these so just have silver gold and red is their colour scheme um, and speaking of red uh, here's a fun trick okay so do, 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 do. Okay, so the red cheat. This is a really uh, fun, easy character design cheat <laughs> you can use, especially if you've just got to design one character for a thing. So I'm going to make a new layer, sketch layer, I'm going to make another new layer sketch layer to get this across and this one is going to be a colour I'm going to pick red okay so the red rule is or the red cheat is simple uh, pick a part of the character that defines what they does defines what they do sorry I can't write today. Okay, so pick a part of the character that designs what that defines what they do. Um, so let's have a think about some game characters we can immediately think of off the top of our head. How about do, 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 Okay. All right. So this character's thing is that they shoot people a lot using their right arm. Okay. So they dress entirely, pretty much in like black or dark color. Commander Shepard. Commander Shepard shoots people a lot. That's his or her thing. I mean, you can make Commander Shepard either gender, which is great, or any gender, I guess. It'd be nice if there were options for, like, in between, I guess. Um, but yeah, Commander Shepard shoots people. So, red, down the right arm. Uh, what else can we think of as a character? Okay, um, so here's a character who runs around a lot and jumps and like d 
does fancy flips and is always on the move and on the run and you see them a lot from the back Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII. She's always jumping around, she's always doing fancy flips, uh, she's got like this cool sword gun thing. Uh, now, it's, now it's lightning with her little curly ponytail thing. Um, so you, in order to break her out of the environment and make her stand out, we have this red cape that is kind of floating around behind her and like trailing behind her movement to like uh, bring it out um so say a so so you can apply this to characters pretty easily by like being like okay well my character uh the, the like this person who punches people okay like the the punchy person so you might decide like well okay then uh, how do I draw attention to the fact that punching is their main thing well I guess I'll give them red gloves um, well, that's that's easy um, or if their thing is like oh hey here's a good one character whose thing is running fast. Well, the, there's only one possibility for this, re like, when we think of a guy who, like, he's always running fast, obviously you think Sonic the Hedgehog. What call the Sonic the Hedgehog shoes? Bright red. He's got red shoes, cause his thing is he, he runs fast. Um, so even though most of him is blue, he's got red shoes that draw attention to his feet and the fact that running fast is his thing he he's a fast runner um and mario most of his upper body is red because his thing is that he jumps and he hits blocks with his head he wears a red hat so the red cheat <laughs> is a really simple way of designing a character where um the the red part draws attention to what their main game mechanic is uh, and it was something I noticed while looking at a lot of characters and uh, just went oh hey there are a lot of characters who use red as a colour. Red is a great colour because it stands out from backgrounds like you will only rarely like you might have that one lava level in your game where things are red um, the exception to the rule and a character design that I think is not great is Kratos from God of War. Um, the problem I have with Kratos, other than his character being terrible in plot terms, but I'm not even going to go into that, is that he's a big grey man who runs around in places that are grey and he's got like these red markings on his body but they're very subdued red and the environments he's in, because they tend to be these kind of hellscapes in the afterlife, tend to also have a lot of red. So Kratos almost never stands out from backgrounds. Whereas you compare, compare say, Dante from Devil May Cry, it's like you can always tell where Dante is in a scene. Because, like, so Dante, he wears, like, uh, he usually wears, like, black, um, in Devil May Cry 3 he had it was like topless, he had like no shirt on, um, which I'm sure was, went down very well with people. So he wears like a black top and vest and then he's got like an uncovered head with white hair and then he wears a bright red coat, like it's just really bright red, it's like this. This looks like Ed Elric actually from Full Metal Alchemist. Um, but it's the same deal. So he's got, he's got a black outfit, a red coat, and then his other thing is, like he's got a a big silver sword, like big silver sword. Or in Ed Elric from Full Metal Alchemist's case, he has like a big silver arm. It's like his arm is 
his arm is made of metal. Um, but this is like a really tried and tested character design, like the red coat. It's um, because to the Japanese, red is the hero colour. Red is the colour of heroism and leadership and bravery. And it tends to be the case outside of Japan as well. We tend to associate the colour red with leadership. That's why the Red Ranger is always the leader of the Power Rangers. It's just, it's like this unspoken rule. It's like, of course the Red Ranger's the leader of the Power Rangers, because he's like the brave one, generally. Um, whereas the Blue Ranger tends to be the voice of reason, and kind of the foil to the Red Ranger. So I'm going to show you some uh, character designs I've done in the past, uh, ones that I've liked and been happy with, and also like talk a bit about how I tend to draw when character designing. So this is uh, Sarian's design from, or her redesign from Vacant Sky, because she had one before this. Um, so uh, Sarian's colour scheme uh, was, from the get-go, it was always going to be purple it was and it it was just this feeling that yeah she should be purple because she's got this kind of proto gothic thing going on you remember what i said about having gothic elements in a fantasy setting so she's got like this leather jacket um which kind of gets across the idea that she's rebellious um she's she's got like this rebellious streak she thinks of herself as a bit kind of anti-authority and bit punk. Um, she's she's a grounded character who uses her mind first, so she's got she's got downward gravity going on. Her hair points downwards, uh, she's got all of this points downwards, she's got a long dress that comes right down to the floor. Uh, so I think of her as very much a downwards gravity character. Um, the wings even, even though wings are like this flighty symbol, they're pointing downwards. The star points downwards, the shapes all are pointing downwards on Sarian. Um, especially because she's a grounded character, because she has this disability of these weak legs. She, she's not, she's not going to be running around. Um, and the shapes tend to draw attention to kind of framing her head because she's thoughtful. Uh, the symbolism here in like the, the snake motifs, uh, you've got the, the alchemical symbol for mercury. Uh, mercury, of course, in alchemy was, a, was associated with life and rebirth. Uh, but as we all know nowadays, mercury is poisonous. Um, so Sarian is both associated with life and rebirth, but also with poison. Um, and her colour scheme also with the the bl with the the purple and green is very much kind of associated with villains in comic books, and it's associated with poison because both purple and green are colours we associate with poisons. Uh, so Sarian's design is, is one of my favourites I've done. Uh, a lot of the, the historical stuff, um, the inspiration for Sarian's design came very much from uh, Regency period British fashion, which is roughly the technological level of um, the land of Orca in the Vacant Sky setting. So you get like this obvious Regency look. She She's sort of like, she could almost be in a BBC costume drama, but then she has that kind of punk thing in the leather jacket going on and the kind of uh, the symbolism and the, the very harsh haircut that looks quite kind of is severe and it's quite modern, which makes her feel quite uh, kind of ahead of her time in a way. Mm. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water there, I'm losing my voice, as usual. Um, you can see that this is very sketchy um, and very simple. I don't spend ages and ages rendering a character design really nicely. I spare that kind of thing for game art because chances are any given character design, you might show it to the other people working on a game and they'll be like, 
ah, could you change this or could you maybe do it more like this so there's no point in spending ages and ages and ages making it look really nice when you don't know if you're gonna have to completely redo it so it's better to do something quickly that you can redo later let's uh sorry and out of the way so this is one that isn't a character design art but the original character designer art for Naura from Vacant Sky is quite old and quite shabby looking so I thought I'd do like I'd use like a later drawing of her that was done for the actual game um so Naura um is an interesting character who I probably can't talk too much about without revealing details of the plot um and there are a lot of symbols in the background and things with this that pertain to her role in the plot but like the character design itself uh, my idea with Naura was that firstly she feels like she's kind of come from somewhere else she doesn't have quite the same Regency look as the Orkin characters she looks kind of steampunky like you look at her and you kind of like she's from somewhere else she's and she's kind of ahead of her time she's she's from outside that uh cultural situation um i used a lot of buttons because buttons have this round shape that is comforting and warm and uh Naura's like she's tough but she's she's bouncy and she's energetic and she's a warm nurturing character who likes to look after her friends uh he's, she's very kind of empathetic um and she she's got this bright red coat because she loves she she likes to stand out um and so red red was like her main colour thing I went for because I didn't have any other characters who were re wearing red and she's got like this lady in red thing going on very much like uh, Vel from Vacant Sky Contention she's kind of this mysterious character who just kind of attaches herself to your party and so I wanted elements that made you think of Vel from Vacant Sky Contention a lot of people hate Vel <laughs> I like Vel. I seem to be like one of the only people who likes Vel as a character. I think she's interesting. Um, also, I wanted her to wear a red jacket because in Vacant Sky Contention, I noticed that um, any character could wear Vel's red jacket um, because Bishop had never thought to program it, so you couldn't. And so you you can dress all of the male characters all. The big tough guys up in this little cropped red jacket so I decided that from now on in every vacant sky game there's going to be a female character who wears some kind of red jacket that can be equipped on everybody <laughs> um, like as a running joke also um, one of the things was that we knew she was going to have some sort of a pendant uh, so I, I kind of designed it to bring to mind like typical plot MacGuffin pendants from JRPGs, uh, particularly like, you know, the one from Chrono Trigger that everyone knows, Princess Mal's amulet. Um, and so I went with teal, because teal and red is a, like, a complementary colour scheme that I really like. Um, and gave her, like, these teal eyes, which is like a, a kind of slightly unnatural eye colour that makes you go, ooh, what's this person's deal? And of course, Naura's big thing is this huge 80s hair. <laughs> um, that was just like a random thing. Firstly, I think of Naura as an upwards, an upwards character with a lot of upwards energy. Um, a lot of detail is built up around her head region. She, her hair has a lot of upwards to it. She's got this big bow. So even though she's wearing a long coat that that sort of weighs gives her some gravity she's also got a lot of kind of she's got a lot of kind of buoyancy up at the top um and i just thought it would be fun to give her this big 80s hair because i'd never seen a character in a game with hair like that and i thought hey that's different it, it makes her stand out i've never seen a character who has like 
massive back combed 80s hair in a game before so let's make this one the first and it, it really made her stand out and makes people remember the character so I just kept it and uh, Bishop for some reason actually let me do this he was like that's weird okay let's go for it uh, so Nara's, Nara's kind of fun and uh, she's got this red scheme that goes against the characters who wear quite muted colours. Um, so uh, speaking of vacant sky contention, it came around to doing a redesign for Aurea from vacant sky contention. Um, Aurea's design originally was kind of to evoke, um, go away CC cleaner, um, Aurea's original design in vacant sky contention was supposed to evoke like your typical teenage girl who writes poetry in her bedroom and she's in a small town so and she might be like the most kind of creative or like the most kind of countercultury girl so she feels very unique but like if she went out in the wider world she probably wouldn't be that unique there are loads of girls like her um, so at the time when the original Vacant Sky Contention was made, it was very much kind of that kind of gothic, um, what we'd call like boho look. So she had like this flowy bell sleeved top that was a bit kind of slightly gothic and she had like these big baggy pants because like when the game was made that was like what that kind of girl wore. And so for the redesign it was kind of okay that kind of girl still exists but they wouldn't wear that kind of fashion and so my immediate thought was uh aria in a more current updated kind of setting she'd be emo like you it, it was just like yeah that's how she would be like skinny jeans and like this plaid shirt like purple and i kept the color scheme with that like denim blue and bright red and purple because to me that was very much part of who Aria is um, and I kept like a little necktie thing and uh, but just did some things with it like I gave her this black nail polish and she's got like all these kind of bracelets and things and you can see that you can use little bits of other colours, uh, just kind of don't overdo it and don't go too far from your colour scheme with them. Especially, like, the smaller they are the more you can get away with, really, with those. Um, so Aria's design was quite fun. Um, so, uh, main character of, um, uh, <laughs> I forgot the name of my own game for a second there. Ars Harmonia. Uh, so Ars Harmonia, um, it was interesting to design this character because it was like, oh, um, there's a lot going on and yet we need her to look really kind of professional at the same time. So she's like this mysterious lady um, and she kind of wanders the world doing like supernatural detective work um, and she has loads of swords and traditionally she has kind of this um, East Asian sort of theme going on to her character uh, but in this one we wanted her to look quite modern so there was a lot to kind of tackle there um, and I tried to get like the sense of the shape of a hakama into this suit so you've got like these kind of downward points and a slight flare on the trousers and you've got a wrap over cardigan underneath the jacket that just gives that sense of the shape of a kimono or a hakama um, and she's got like this kind of hair up in a bun that gives this slightly sort of samurai-ish feel um, in spite of the fact that she's dressed in a professional business suit and um, long trousers it looked a bit boring like there wasn't enough detail on the legs so I decided to go with like these kind of like a short like cropped trouser um, so she was a 
really difficult design actually to get right and her colour scheme is quite kind of there's kind of pinks and purples but with a lot of neutral colours uh, let's close her down um, so this is one I did recently for myself uh, it's my new Dungeons and Dragons character but I really liked how did the design came out because uh, it, it was kind of like oh um, I had this idea in mind from the get-go um, so uh, there's a lot of symbolism within the setting because the character worships uh, the god Ilmater um, we're in a Forgotten Realms setting which if you've familiarity with uh, games like Baldur's Gate Neverwinter Nights you'll know the um, the Forgotten Realms setting, which is currently uh, the main setting for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Uh, it always used to be like Greyhawk was the main setting, but they finally realised that Forgotten Realms makes more sense because that's where all the popular video games have been set. Um, so Ilmater is like this god of uh, kind of... God of suffering, but not like in causing suffering, he's more like the god of like uh, getting through suffering. It's like compassion and fortitude and getting through hard times and helping people who are going through hard times. Um, so having a, a, a sorceress or sorcerer whose background is very religious struck me as quite an interesting idea because normally you have like the religious classes being like paladin and cleric and then wizards tend to be like more more kind of secular i guess um whereas i, I wanted to have like a an arcane caster who's religious as one of her things so she's got like this rosary and uh the red wrapped hands that mimic the symbol of Ilmater oh uh, mm. I knew from the get-go that there was going to be red in her colour scheme because red is associated with Ilmater and also associated with fire and uh, so with this colour scheme I actually really only I mean I used a blue here just to set things off like gave her a blue bedroll um, but apart from that I went with just red black and white which it's just a classic colour scheme that you can't really go wrong with red black and white and you can see that with this design I've just made the whole of the legs is just black um, it's very simple there's not a lot of detail and things are separated by colours so you have like white red white red black white red black uh, like light here and then black hair so you have the the colors uh, I'm really happy with this design because the colors break each other up you've got like a light silver here surrounded by black um, and so it just balances nicely um, and the the black legs against the white here and she's got kind of a downward gravity going on but also then it's up up here I don't normally do that I tend to be like this character is an up character this character is a down character but you can combine the two to get a character who is being pulled in different directions in a sense so um, that's something about this character that at the top she's being pulled up um, almost like she's trying to ground herself with the clothes she wears but something about her is pulling her in the opposite direction uh, and she is kind of fighting against it so you can use a character's gravity in that sense uh, you can also I've also got the red rule being used here um, like you've got the red is used on the rosary that draws attention to it it's like this character is religious the her rosary is important uh, one of the things about the character I felt was that she's always like fiddling with her rosary um, in some way and she's got red hands because of course sorcerers are a classic they cast magic and they use like all these hand movements to cast their magic so the red hands like draw attention to that she's always 
fidgeting with her hands and she uses her hands to cast magic. Uh, so that's the red cheat in action as well. Um, so yeah, um, I hope you don't mind that I haven't drawn a lot this episode, but I hope you've found it uh, really informative and that it's told you uh, some really useful tricks and tips that you can use to like improve your character designs. Um, and I mean one of the things I think is just keep at it, uh, don't automatically assume that your first attempt at a character design is going to be perfect, because it might not be, just uh, don't be afraid to try reworking a character design or to do some variations or to cut details out, just be, be brutal about what you cut out, decide what the really important details of a character design are and take away anything that isn't adding something like that isn't telling the audience something about that character or adding some detail where it's really needed or breaking up something like just yeah just just think in terms of what can i remove to make the essence of this character just as clear as possible and just get it down to its purest form. So yeah, that's been my first episode on character design. If you'd like more episodes on character design and clarification or just like an episode where I'm just designing characters for the whole thing, definitely leave comments and because people, I'd really like to have some comments from people about what they'd like to see more of or things they'd like to learn that they'd like me to like go over in an episode because uh, seriously I'd be happy for that to happen it'd be nice to hear about things you're struggling with and don't be afraid that you'll feel stupid for not knowing how to do something that you think is obvious because a lot of the time in art nothing is as simple as you might think so this has been Chilled Out, thanks for watching and join us next time. You can support this show on Patreon, thank you to all the people who already do, you've been fantastic, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching everyone.